Today is October 14th, and this is Conversations from Stretch. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we were off last week, but we're excited to be back and looking forward to our conversation today with our guest, Dr. Christy Billups, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Uh, the last two weeks have been incredibly busy on campus. It just feels like we are back to this immense amount of activity uh, that is going on, uh, lectures and activities and uh, athletic events. Uh, one of those events this week um, was the Brother Bernard Rapp Lecture, which was part of the Cumby Lecture Series. Brother Guy Consolmagno, who is the director of the Vatican Observatory in Rome, uh, was on campus this week, and uh, we were so honored to have him. He offered a, a really thoughtful and provocative discussion of how scientists and engineers make sense of religion. Uh, this is an area that is a, of great interest to me because of my uh, my own interest in uh, religion, and uh, I used to teach a class on science and religion, so it was, it was great not only to be at his lecture, but also uh, to have dinner with him uh, the night before. So we were uh, very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, well, I'm also excited to have our first um, campus visit day coming up this weekend. Uh, on Saturday, we're looking forward to welcoming over 200 families to campus to hear about all the possibilities that a Lewis education offers. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day on Saturday, so uh, we are really looking forward to welcoming those families. And I would just say to those prospective students, uh, if you didn't get into this one, there's another one uh, next month. Uh, but also for all of our current students and faculty and staff who might be watching, uh, just know that we're going to have a lot of prospective students on campus uh, this weekend. And so if you're out and about, you know, of course, uh, be your normal friendly selves and welcome everybody to campus because uh, they want to get a sense of what Lewis is like uh, on its ongoing basis. And uh, Saturday should be a great day uh, with lots of people on campus. So in addition to um, uh, Brother Guy's lecture, we've had a lot of things going on, you know, kind of in the academic world of Lewis. So uh, Dr. Christopher Sent joins me as usual today. So uh, Chris, uh, what's been going on on campus? And thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. And yeah, it's been really a great couple of weeks with activities on campus. Uh, Brother Guy's lecture was, was really inspiring and interesting uh, for me as well. Um, so a couple things that are, that are uh, accomplishments from members of our community in the, in the broader world. Um, we just had, uh, was it two, three weeks ago? Yeah, three um, weeks ago. A yeah. music professor, Dr. Adrienne Honnold, assistant professor of music. Um, she was uh, here with us talking about her first uh, semester on campus. She was recently appointed to serve the College of Music Society program, on the College of Music Society programming committee for the 39th annual Great Lakes Regional Conference. Um, Honnold will work with colleagues across that conference um, to help plan the uh, upcoming events uh, scheduled to be held at Millican uh, University this March. Um, the Will County Health Department uh, recently presented a plaque to the Lewis University College of Nurse, Nursing and Health Sciences during a recent board meeting um, in recognition for all of the work that the Lewis University students and faculty provided toward the county's COVID-19 response thus far. Then that response, that work that we did, we've talked about on the show several times, but you know, involved hosting uh, testing sites here on campus um, with our student uh, nurses, uh, nursing students um, participating and uh, working there, uh, contact tracing, and over a thousand hours of assistance at vaccine clinics across the Will County. So thank you again to our nursing faculty and students for their contributions that have been really um, unique and powerful during the pandemic. Congratulations also to Professor of Nursing, Michelle Kramer, who uh, co-authored an article called Illuminating Nursing's Value the 12 Anthroposophic Nursing Gestures um, in, uh, that was published in the Journal of Holistic Nursing. And, and uh, Kayla DeCant, uh, Project Director of Prevention and Outreach here at Lewis, was uh, recently featured in the Community Psychologist uh, Journal about, uh, in an article about bridging the gap between research and practice. 
Kayla will also present uh, coming up at the Alliance for Nonprofit Management Conference. Uh, I think it was maybe today or yesterday. Um, so congratulations to her. Um, and then Lewis, if you haven't seen it, if back to the on-campus events and uh, things to do here, Lewis is currently hosting a really beautiful art exhibition called As We See It, featuring members of the Chicago Society of Artists which includes painting, drawing, photography, sculpture, minor cut, encaustic, and mixed media. So it's just, it's wonderful to see work in, in one show from all different mm -hmm. um, uh, formats and different artists. That show will be up uh, through October 22nd in the Brenton and Jean Wadsworth Family Gallery as usual, and there will be a reception and gallery talk at 7 p.m. on October 21st. So I'm looking forward to, to that. And all kinds of stuff now also going on in, in um, athletics, and yeah. maybe um, you can share those. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it really is amazing to see all, uh, all that's going on athletically on campus uh, in addition to these academic achievements of both uh, our students and our faculty. Uh, the regular season is in the books for Lewis men's and women's cross-country teams. Uh, they enter the postseason ranked number 16 and number 18, respectively, in U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Association national polls. Both teams finished second last weekend at the Lewis Conference crossover, and Lewis will next race uh, in a week and a half or so um, on October 23rd here on campus for the GLBC Cross Country Championships. Um, the 16th, uh, so come out and see that if you, if you haven't seen a cross country race, if you're a student on campus and you're not used to this, well worth coming out because there'll be hundreds of runners, literally. Of course, all their parents and friends and family that can come in, uh, but we have one of the best courses in the Chicagoland area. So uh, it, it you know, should be a beautiful day, uh, fall day. And so come out and cheer on um, uh, our cross country runners. Um, our 16th ranked women's volleyball team will compete Friday and Saturday in the 13th annual Midwest Region Volleyball Crossover Tournament in Hammond, Indiana. Lewis is the number one seed from the GLVC and will play three matches over two days. They will start with uh, number 25, Michigan Tech. Uh, they'll play number 17, Hillsdale. And on... Uh, Those are both on Friday. Both on Friday. Yeah. Um, and and we, we are... Uh, you know, really uh, thrilled by uh, the, the competitive level that once again our women's volleyball team uh, is showing. Um, you know, again, don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but uh, look forward to uh, a really successful rest of the season, second half of the season, as well as hopefully some impressive postseason uh, experience both in the GLVC tournament for women's volleyball as well as hopefully the national tournament. Men's and women's soccer teams are on the road this weekend with games against Rockhurst and William Jewell. Uh, as I think both Chris and I have been to some soccer games, they are both having uh, really mm -hmm. great seasons as well. So uh, we feel really good about um, where this fall is starting out. I was just, um, you and I have talked about this, Chris, I was just at the uh, GLVC president's uh, mm -hmm. meeting. Last year, uh, we were the number two team among the 15 teams in kind of uh, where we uh, landed um, relative to all the sports that we do and you kind of get points on whether you finish first, second, third in the conference. So uh, second out of 15 teams is pretty amazing and this fall I feel like we're starting off really well yeah. because I think we have uh, real potential to uh, win or finish in the top three on the cross country side in a you know, week and a half here on our own campus. Uh, and of course, in many other uh, areas, I also and you know at some point maybe in the next year and a half we'll get him on. But I, I don't know if I mentioned to you that I um, had in my office. I just do these welcome to campus for all our new employees. But I had our new swimming coach mm. in my office yesterday, and he of course is getting used to the team, and uh, they are starting their practices, and will be uh, of course competing in a couple months uh, mm -hmm. in our in our pool. So. Um, we also, of course, have issues around um, making sure that our community continues to know what's going on with COVID. So maybe you could give us a little update on what's going on in that area. Sure, I'd love to do that. And it's been a couple of weeks since we were reporting in this format, so I'm, you know, I have a few updates to make. 
So I guess first we'll show um, the usual update um, graphic that, that we share. So our uh, Will County cases per 100,000 yesterday was 145. So that's still a little bit of a plateau. I would say it's gone down. It's plateaued at a, at a, at a rate that's a little lower than our, than our peak about three or four weeks ago. But still in the red zone. Um, according to the CDC standards and guidelines. Our positive cases in the Lewis community has continued to be pretty uh, uh, flat at about five or six per week. So far we've had one this week, but I think as we've mentioned before, we are uh, now doing the regular testing on campus on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, or Tuesdays and Wednesdays, excuse me. So we often get results back around today, and um, you know, so sometimes there we get um, some positive cases coming through that process. So that's so far one this week and more on that uh, as we report on the website on Friday as well as, um, uh, as, well as we'll report next week on, on those numbers. The uh, vaccination rate in our community, I think if we could show that again, it has changed a little bit. The rate itself is 90 and 91% for employees and students uh, with 93% uh, vaccinated students in the residence halls. So really strong numbers, but I just really want to point out the student reporting number has gone up to 92% as of today or yesterday. And so that um, has been uh, a really a, a great um, achievement by our COVID hotline team, by our students who are uh, reporting their vaccination status and, and uh, requesting exemptions. So um, thank you for everyone for, for making that work. We really have great um, reporting numbers and that number will uh, go up in the, in, in the weeks to come. And uh, vaccination, vaccination rates over 90%. Otherwise, I really just have a few updates uh, related to COVID. In fact, I'll say now that I'm not going to send an email out today. Wow. Uh, First time in, what, 18 months? Everybody gets a break. Um, today, there aren't a lot of new, uh, a lot of new information. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to maybe try to go every two weeks for a while and see how that goes. Um, but here are some reminders that would have been in my daily email. Um, this is a great time to get a flu shot. Um, our health experts, both in our hotline team as well as you've probably heard it across the community and in the news and so on, but there is a higher risk of flu this uh, winter predicted by by health experts than than um, what was likely last year. So please get your flu shot. It really will help um, uh, so many aspects of the COVID-19 effort as well as the flu effort across the country. Um, we are uh, we have begun uh, imposing fines and registration holds for those few number of students who are left who are either not reported their vaccination status or are, have not been. Uh, participating in the in the um, testing protocol reminder that um, testing uh, you submit testing on Thursdays by 6 p.m. and um, if you have not uh, submitted a test in a two-week period I believe it is then there is a, um, a fine uh, placed on those students holds and people who are in that category of registration holds and fines uh, are uh, being communicated with directly via email um, so that, that, that they should be getting that message. Um, weekly testing, uh, we are going to do, uh, we continue to do uh, PCR testing on campus in Memorial Hall, um, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Tuesdays and 11 a.m. Thank right. you. 8 a.m. Yeah. to 11 a.m. on Tuesdays and 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Wednesdays. And just a reminder that that is available to all members of our community and there is a registration process on the website. It's not um, limited to those who are required to test, but it, it is a, it's a service that's available now on campus for those two, two days a week regularly. And then finally, um, a reminder to um, stay home uh, if you are, have, are sim have symptoms or are sick. Um, whether you are vaccinated or not, please contact your healthcare provider and report symptoms using the Lewis U app um, symptom screening tile. So Chris, I just wanna ask a, a quick question about this. Um, um, I, I, I'm interested in 
the issues around what you're hearing, because I know you work with the hotline team all the time, around the, the flu-like symptoms. I guess I want to follow up on this, getting the flu vaccine, mm -hmm. because I could imagine us in December, uh, late November, when flu season starts and people didn't get their flu shot, that they might think they have COVID, mm -hmm. and that really difficult distinction between COVID yeah. symptoms and flu symptoms. So part of the reason we're really pushing the flu mm -hmm. vaccine this year is because we want to make sure um, that that we don't overburden ourselves with anxiety as well as, of course, with sickness, mm -hmm. because there, it's hard to distinguish, as I understand it, between sure. what the flu yeah. symptoms are and what the COVID symptoms are. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're hearing from the hotline team. And, um, and I, I assume that most of the places where you can get a COVID vaccination shot, you can all, like if you go to a CVS and they're yes. giving COVID, I can get the flu vaccine there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if we know, I, I don't know the answer to this, whether I can get the COVID and a flu vaccine the same day. Like, can I do, is it I don't know wise? the answer okay, to that. I don't either. And I, <laughs> pro you know, we could probably figure that out or some, yeah. uh, uh, somebody at CVS would tell you that. But right. um, I don't know if you have any further comments on that. But that's certainly true. Yeah, that. we recommend, you know, getting that flu um, vaccination. The, um, you know, again, I, I just think it, everything you just said kind of reinforces that that what I what I said at the end there where you know you could have flu symptoms and you know either way please stay home um, and then I just want to again say if you have there is we are very um, encouraging of people to get uh, uh, COVID tests in part and it's okay if you have it's great if you have the flu <laughs> instead of COVID and you know and that's that's a great reason to get a COVID test I guess is the maybe yes, the one thing right. I'm hearing is that if yeah. you are symptomatic and, you know, of course, talk to a healthcare professional first. But if you, you know, we have these tests available because there are, we, ha we are having a lot of, you know, negative tests, of course, across the country. And that's one of the reasons is that sure. there are people who are symptomatic with other um, sicknesses, including the flu. Yeah, so we, uh, as we've mentioned already, we've had a really active um, few weeks. And it, it's been, uh, I, I think I've said to you off, off air several times that I've kind of had to build up my um, my capacity to be at six or seven events yeah. a week in the evenings, all those kinds of things, because I, you know, we had less of that and uh, many more online activities last year. And now it feels like we're having these hybrid activities in person, also available online. Another shout out to uh, John Kilpatrick and his entire crew because they've done a lot of this event. But this um, transitions us into our guest today. Mm -hmm. So this week was the Peace Teach-In, and maybe you could introduce our guest and and we can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, it's an exciting set of uh, lectures mm -hmm. and opportunities for our students. Yeah, and before I, I introduce uh, Dr. Christy Billups, I also, you just touched on it a little bit there, but one of the things that's happening that I'm experiencing as I'm building up my capacity is that the, there are, we're experimenting with different formats. We've been to the in-person events, we've been to hybrid events, we've been to online events all during this week. And it's been really interesting to, as we kind of sort through and wonderful, and we can ask our guest about this, but just wonderful to see people from all over the country and the world. Mm -hmm. I'm sure t at tonight's event, which we'll talk about, there will be international um, uh, participants, but it's also been great to be in a room with other people watching, mm -hmm. engaging in conversation. And then speaking of that, we are going to go back in time technologically now and have a guest virtually. We've been having a lot of in-person guests, <laughs> exactly. um, but it's great that we have these options. And Dr. Billups is very busy right now um, in the middle of the uh, teaching. So she just stepped away from, uh, from an event to, to speak with us and we're very grateful. So I'd like to introduce her now. Dr. Christy Billups is an associate professor of theology and co-founder and co-director of the Peace and Justice Studies program here at Lewis. She's also co-founder and director of the Brother Jeffrey Grow FSC Institute for Dialogue, Justice, and Social Action. She has an MA in teaching from National Lewis University and an MA in pastoral studies and doctor of ministry degrees from the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She's had practical, pedagogical, and ministerial experience in a wide range of places, churches, schools, jails, and prisons, and all of this informs her teaching as well as her work for justice. And so we are very pleased to 
welcome Dr. Billups. Hi, we can see you. Thanks Great to see me. you. Um, I'm not sure we can hear you. Christy, could you just, uh, I, I not, they might be able to hear you, but in studio. So I'm partly talking to John to say whether, um, whether everybody can hear, uh, hear you. So maybe you could, uh, maybe you could start by, um, just, uh, telling us a little bit about what is going on with the Peace Teach-In this week. So good to be here and good to see you, Chris and, I, and Dave. And um, the, the Peace Teach-In is an annual three-day event that uh, lifts up issues of justice and injustice and invites us to explore those and to imagine ways that we can move forward in action to address those injustices. It's been going on for something like 20 years and uh, the philosophy department of that time started it and it has been carried recently by now the GROW Institute and um, members of various departments across the university. Um, we've addressed issues in the past such as restorative justice, uh, gun violence as a public health issue, and um, the various walls that divide us as a human family. So this year we're talking about moving from fear to compassion and examining ways that we can do that proactively. Yeah, I've really enjoyed um, uh, last night. I really enjoyed the play. I mean, it was, you know, obviously it was, it was theatrical, but also really just um, vulnerable. You know, people were just being, sharing their experience. Um, but I know the events have, have covered a lot of things and students have had a lot of um, different experiences. Maybe you could um, talk a little bit about um, some of the highlights that you've had so far, both, both maybe in terms of some of the insights that some of the speakers have offered, but also maybe some of the things you've seen either the kind of wheels turning in the minds of students or some of their own comments and questions that have really, um, you know, I, I think this week is always a week where we're proud of who we are. As Lewis, I'm certainly proud of what you are doing and appreciate your leadership. Um, but it's a, it's a set of moments for our students to have some things click into place for them. Uh, obviously, there's moments of being uncomfortable because some of these subjects are, they create that sense of... Uh, of tension and, and being uncomfortable. Maybe you could talk about some of what you've seen as the highlights of the week. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I appreciated last night as well. Um, and for those of you who are unable to join us, it was uh, three women connected to the carceral system, uh, two of them formerly incarcerated. And uh, through spoken word and music and poetry, they shared a bit of their stories and as Dr. Livingston said, their vulnerabilities. And so uh, we had some good conversation. It was uh, my, my class of practicing faithful justice was part of the audience and asked some, I think, engaging questions about what those difficult, those particularly difficult moments in the lives and journeys of the women who shared their stories last night and we also, and I know we'll get into this in a minute, but we also do some of this in our class where we break that open in peace circles and uh, bring our own vulnerability to bear. And I really appreciated that the women talked about that fine line. And, you know, we often do a very us and them about people who are incarcerated. Mm. And yet there's a fine line because all of us make poor choices. All of us have wounds. All of us have... Um, you know, had suffering in our lives. So I really appreciated that they brought that up. The um, event I just stepped out of was graciously hosted by uh, Dr. Menaz Afridi, who is uh, a professor at Manhattan College in New York. So she came with her students, one of the blessings of hmm. figuring out how to do all this virtual stuff. And uh, they shared some of their insights about becoming more conscious of realities of those in a variety of religious and faith traditions and needing to open our eyes and become more educated about people who um, practice and believe differently than we do. 
So that was uh, very engaging and I really appreciated she and her students' contributions. Um, tomorrow, um, kind of a fun activity that's coming up is uh, on the archery range, which I think some of us are going to have to seek out. I believe it's not too far from the soccer field, but uh, the, the program is entitled Targeting Injustice and some of the women most responsible for our women's studies program will be tapping into a little bit of the Hunger Games. And those of you who know that, know that Katniss was an archer. And um, so talking about issues of injustice and then also trying our hand with a bow and arrow. And then um, tonight, I'd really like to highlight uh, the Grow Memorial event. And uh, so that I don't forget to say it, registration is required. And the entire, it's entitled The Gift of Our Wounds, and we will have Pardeep Singh Kaleka and Arno Michaelis joining us virtually to talk about their own journey of relationship and, again, vulnerability. Pardeep's father was a victim of the shooting at the Sikh Gudwara, which is a, a place of worship for Sikh people, um, in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. His father was one of six victims of a hate shooting in 2012 in Oak Creek. And that event really helped Oak Creek as a community to evolve as an interfaith and beautiful community standing in solidarity with their sick brothers and sisters. And Arno used to be a white supremacist, very deeply into hateful beliefs and actions. And he will be engaging with Pardeep. They've become very dear friends and uh, wrote a book together and will share their experiences of trying to build bridges from very different beginnings in their lives to a place now where they collaborate on building understanding and the bridges that guide us to connecting with one another. So those are a handful of highlights. That sounds um, very powerful. Really looking forward to that event tonight. And again, um, we just showed the, the, the web page and, and, and you do need to register if you're watching now and, and are inspired to register, please do that. Um, Christy, maybe uh, going back a little bit to uh, reflecting on last night, it was just really notable to see you there in the room with your students um, watching <laughs> with the rest of us the play. Um, could you tell us a little bit how students are involved in the in the week's activities? You just mentioned a, another, you know, the thing going on right now is a collaborative event with students from Manhattan uh, College as well. And um, how does it relate to classes? How do students participate and participate in the planning? Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to give a shout out to John Kilpatrick and um, the IT department here at Lewis. Uh, the reference was made to learning how to do things in new ways, hybrid ways, technological ways, and we could not do what we do without people who are more knowledgeable in those areas than we are, and so I'm just really, really grateful. So I just wanted to do a shout out there. Um, students, so we, we're going to get into this in a moment, I believe, but Peace and Justice students help us to understand what is timely and um, determine some of the places that our peace teachings need to go. As I mentioned, and as you reiterated, the Manhattan College students were involved in sharing their thoughts. Um, and, and then classes are attending. Um, my class of practicing faithful justice was in the room last night. And that input from women who were formerly incarcerated very much fits into our attempts to remember the humanity of those who are behind bars and uh, the fact that we are in human community together. And so it really evoked some good conversations after the presentation. Um, I, I know that uh, political science students came yesterday to an event that Dr. James Burke uh, in Theology and Peace and Justice Studies did on community organizing. Mm -hmm. in, again, this idea of we can have conversations about justice and, and sometimes in an academic milieu, we get a little bit focused on talking about it. And we are really hoping to 
evoke enough passion and inspiration to motivate students and the others to choose to act on the injustices we learn about and figure out together how we can move toward a more just future. So you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Christy, just a, a couple things that I wanna just point out. We had a question come in about whether a, uh, in order to be involved in this, whether a student has to be a peace studies major. But I, I'd love for you to, I know the answer to that, but I'll let you comment on it. Um, but I'd love you to, because you mentioned it, maybe a brief, because uh, we have other questions we want to get to, as you said, about peace circles and other things, but maybe a brief description of what is a peace studies major, because I think many people watching wouldn't even know what that is, and then maybe how a, a general student who's not a peace studies major can be involved in this week. So everyone is welcome student at the peace teaching students, uh, you know, community or organization members, uh, people of the general public. Um, everyone is welcome who is able to either join us on campus or um, uh, the virtual events obviously make it a lot easier and safer, but uh, everyone is welcome. Peace and Justice Studies, so we've, we've just recently expanded the name a little, so we're trying to get used to that. Peace and Justice Studies looks at attempting to adjust our lenses, if you will, how we see things, how we see people, how we see communities. We do that in a very intentionally interfaith and anti-racist way. Uh, we do that through community engagement. We try to, we, we build into the major and the minor multiple opportunities for students to uh, participate in community engaged learning and really connect with people in the community so as to see things through other people's eyes, uh, walk in their shoes, if you will, and to strategize together, how can we make a difference? How can we adjust or um, amend or imagine a way forward that is more inclusive, more loving and compassionate, more empathic with uh, the realities of people who are sometimes left out of the conversation. So um, let me know if a little more detail or-, or No, I, I think well, that's great. And you might want to yeah. ask her about- um, Well, I have a couple of yeah, go ahead. follow ups to that. Yeah, please. Uh, the, well, first of all, I'll just say it, say it clearly. Um, so Christy doesn't have to, that the, there's a major and a minor. And could maybe, could you just, you know, obviously majors and minors have different amounts of classes and everyone knows what those are, but the, could you just give us a little set of examples, you know, and, and I guess I'll just say they are interdisciplinary, which means that they combine different, not only different skills and learning from different areas of knowledge, but um, they're particularly interdisciplinary in connection to all of those things that, that, that you mentioned. So could you just give some examples? Like if, if I'm a, if I'm going to be a, a major, what am I going to take? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the practicing faithful justice course that I mentioned is part of the core of the major and as is, as you might imagine, a foundations course, foundations mm -hmm. in peace studies. And um, there are 13 disciplines involved. So thank you for bringing up the interdisciplinarity of the major and the minor. The major's 36 credits, the minor is 22. And we also, there's two angles I wanna to just toss out as briefly as possible. One is that we look at peace in three, at three levels. One is the fact that if we don't address our own internal worlds, our own personal relationships, we're not very good peace builders beyond that. So we go from the internal uh, immediate relationships to looking at the local, regional, communities right around us and really engaging. That was the community engaged learning uh, factor. And we wanna make sure that we get to know our neighbors and the realities they're facing. And then in a third external circle, we look at the national and global realities that we're looking at with poverty or immigration or other factors that um, diminish human thriving. We have in the major five pathways that might help people to get a sense of, of what we focus on. Um, and those pathways are conflict transformation, which 
could have a local implication, but also has global applications. Uh, restorative justice, which has to do with um, building connections and storytelling and resolving conflicts in uh, various restorative practices. And I can say more about that in a minute. Human rights and development. So again, looking at ways that we ensure that everybody has the resources that they need and can thrive. Women and gender equity and inclusion. And uh, that continues to be something we want to strive for. And then, as I've already alluded, the interfaith aspect of what we do is very important to Peace and Justice Studies and the GROW Institute that I know we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, our fifth pathway is the interfaith and intercultural bridge building pathway. So those um, very intentional attempts to build bridges between peoples who have different religious beliefs or cultural backgrounds. There's just a, an amazing amount to talk about. I wish we could have like three hours to talk. So I want to just say one thing. I just feel like you know, we have 80 different programs on campus. There are so many majors in which a minor in peace and justice studies will really help a person later on in their life. And so education, business, you know, uh, uh. law, people who want to, you know, be a social worker, people who want to study sociology, uh, people who want to do organizational leadership. I mean, it's just an amazing um, complement to what it is that they're learning in their key area. So um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we're going to run out of time. So I do want to, uh, maybe we can go to the Jeffrey Grow, the Brother Jeffrey Grow uh, Institute and maybe we'll come back to peace circles, but I just want to make sure that we uh, give a little time to uh, what is sponsoring tonight's mm -hmm. um, really impressive uh, set of speakers. Uh, I'm about three fourths of the way through their book. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly disturbing, I must say. Uh, I'm glad yeah. I'm reading it, and I'm, you know, um, I'm looking forward to tonight because I've really been um, disturbed by. Uh, and enlightened by some of the things that are in there. But could you talk a little bit about the GROW Institute um, so that we have a sense of uh, you know, what's allowing us to do this kind of great work that we're doing here? I would be happy to. I, I cannot help, but I must interject, though. It, it, and I totally 100% agree with the fact that the minor is a wonderful dovetail to many other majors. And that the major also could lead to a lot of really life-giving and fulfilling careers. And so just to invite our students to go to uh, the Peace and Justice Studies webpage is to learn a little bit more about the careers. Because I know a lot of people might not um, imagine it as a, a, a career-based major. And so I just wanted to throw that in that there are different ways that Peace and Justice Studies can absolutely Amen. lead to. Amen. I'm, I'm with you, Christy. Yes. So GROW Institute, um, about, I would say, five years ago, maybe six years ago, a handful of faculty and staff at Lewis started to have conversations about what I referenced before, which was we have conversations about justice. Many of us are impassioned about making a difference or helping our students to feel a sense of agency about what they can do to make the world better. Um, and there was some kind of, I don't know, angst, if you will, about how do we get it to actually move us into action? How can we really imagine ways forward together? And so this conversation led us very organically and collaboratively and restoratively. We use restorative uh, peace circles to, to get us to discern what this needed to be. And we had a pretty good idea of where we wanted to go as far as, again, moving justice into action through ecumenical interfaith and intercultural dialogue. And um, I had the honor of very briefly working with Brother Jeffrey Grow. For about a year and a half, he was a, a scholar in residence at Lewis, and he committed his life to fostering ecumenism, which is dialogue between uh, Christian traditions as well as uh, interfaith cooperation. And it just seemed very 
appropriate to name the Institute after Brother Jeff and uh, live live into his legacy and, and bring that forward. And so we're, we're working on a few initiatives. Um, we're trying to articulate them as they come into being. One would be uh, community organizing, which I mentioned, um, and you know, trying to continue to network in collaboration with the Office of Community Engaged Learning to understand our neighbors better and to work side by side with addressing some of the uh, resourcing needs or deficits that they may have um, and to, to really listen deeply to their journeys. Uh, restorative justice initiative is doing some of the same and using restorative practices, particularly peace circles and mediation as ways that we can continue to foster deep listening in schools, communities, and uh, it happens a lot in, in relation to the court and prison systems, but we're really right now at least focused on area community organizations and schools and helping them to grow that. And then an initiative that's sort of coming online now is the Eco Justice Initiative. And we deeply wanna be a part of the solutions around confronting the climate crisis that we face as a human family and as a planet. Wonderful, it's great. And, and, and really the, the Peace Teach-In Week really showcases and embraces so many of the things that you've talked about across that whole range from the major uh, to the, to the, the GROW Institute um, and, the, and just the work that you and, and, and others do um, on campus in, in connection to all this work. You did mention um, a couple of things. The, community engagement, community engaged learning. We won't go deep into those things, but um, I think the peace teaching is another, you know, it's another um, way that we really embrace um, how important our community partners are because they are participating in so many of the events of this week um, in collaboration with our uh, community, with the Lewis community members and students. Uh, and so that's really beautiful to see. I, I, I guess we'll just, finally get to asking you what a peace what a peace circle is it's a big um, part of the week I think there's one every day or two every day or at least one every day um, and and so maybe just give people a sense of, of what happens at at a, at a peace circle or what, what it's about yeah so a peace circle uh, is something that comes out of various global indigenous traditions and certainly specifically some of our uh, in American indigenous communities have graciously shared this practice of gathering literally in circle to deeply listen to one another, to share our stories. We use a talking piece so that only one person is sharing at a moment, any given time, and the rest of us engage in a deep listening. Um, values are established like honesty and respect and confidentiality, and again, this deep listening that we don't often get a chance to do mm. in our day to day because of how busy we tend to be, especially in our society. And in this listening, we find ways to really bind our stories, bind our human realities to one another in really powerful ways that build relationship and then inspire us to act for good. Mm. So um, that's one of the shortest explanations That's, I can give. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah. Uh, thank and, you uh, so much. And I know, you know, one of the exciting things for me about this in, in, uh, in the work I do for the university is I, I hear in the broader community about how appreciative, uh, completely disconnected, I mean, they're not disconnected because they're in our community, but they're not directly connected to Lewis University in terms of a class or a you know vendor or whatever, but they are learning from the work that you and your colleagues are doing because you're going out in the community and teaching people how to use peace circles in order to enhance who they are as an organization or as a you know village or whatever. And I think that's really um, excellent work and I'm really grateful uh, that you're willing to extend yourself out into the community and do that work. So thank you for that. Chris, any other questions pleasure. for uh, for Christy? No, I think we are just about out of yeah, time. So, yeah. uh, Christy, thank you again so much for taking the time out of your day um, during this 
really busy week and, and talking with us today. And thanks for all thanks your for work. Having and, me. and again, there are many people we didn't mention who are contributing to this. And thank you to all of those people um, who are making this week work, and, and as well as the institute and the, the major. Yeah. So yeah, and I'll I'll uh, just second that. Thank you so much, Dr. Billups, for joining us. Uh, we are grateful for. Um, all of your uh, kind of professional and scholarly work that you bring to the table on this, uh, your leadership uh, in the peace and justice major and minor. Um, and I want to just remind people uh, tonight, uh, I think it'll be a really impressive um, event, maybe a little challenging for um, some of you, but I think it's a, a going to be a really great event tonight. Make sure you register uh, if you want to attend tonight. And I just want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, one more thing for yes. Chris. You can get a flu shot and a vaccine uh, for COVID-19 at the same visit. <laughs> See? It, it's amazing thank how you. quickly we get this information back. You, you can get a COVID vaccine and a flu shot at the same day. So go to your local pharmacy uh, or look on our website because we have lots of locations where you can get uh, a COVID vaccine and get your flu shot at the same time if you haven't done that so far. Uh, Hope to see you tonight at the event. Um, <clears throat> have a wonderful weekend. Uh, many blessings to you and your family. Thanks for joining us.